Hey guys and welcome to another fun and easy machine learning tutorial on recurrent neural networks. Ah chess, a classic game of strategy. So say we are playing a game of chess and we want to train a typical artificial neural network to compete against a chess grandmaster. Now we can feed the neural network with huge amount of data based on all possible moves which is an immense amount of data to learn from. There are literally over 288 billion different possible positions after 4 moves apiece. It would be insanely inefficient and computationally expensive to train a network of in this respect. Of course, there are hard-coded algorithms that can play chess or go based on a set of rules. But how would we train an ANN to do this? Let's take a look at how humans perform such tasks. As we play, we look at the moves we made as well as the moves our opponents make in the moment. These are similar to our inputs into the network. Now, if we make moves just based on our inputs, we would lose dismally. This is because our ANN would not follow preceding moves and thus not suspect ulterior motives and tricks from the opponent. This is where RNNs come into play. RNNs would feed the data from previous iterations into the nodes of the network at the current iteration, thus allowing it to have some memory of events that occurred. This element of remembering what moves the opponent made can now help the network deduce his or her intentions with each progressive move. Sort of like building up an intuition based on past experiences and events. We'll touch on a few more significant applications later in this lecture. Please subscribe and click that bell icon to join our notification squad. Architecture of RNNs The idea behind RNNs is to use sequential information. In a traditional neural network, we assume that all inputs and outputs are independent of each other. But for many tasks, that's a very bad idea. If you want to predict the next move in chess and go, you better know which moves were made before it. RNNs are called recurrent because they perform the same task for every element of a sequence, without the output being dependent on previous competitions. Another way to think about RNNs is that they have some sort of memory which captures information about what has been calculated so far. In theory, RNNs can make use of information in arbitrarily long sequences, but in practice, they are limited to looking back only a few steps. Recurrent neural networks are popular models that have shown great promise in many natural language processing or NLP tasks. So for example, if you ask Google Assistant who landed on the moon followed by the question how old is he, you will be replied to with the age of Neil Armstrong. And now if you ask this to Siri, it won't be able to answer the second question because it only looks at the current input and does not remember the questions you had prior to it. Well, that's until they eventually update to the next iOS anyway. If you are new to neural networks, please check out my lecture on artificial neural networks and convolutional neural networks for this lecture to make sense. So here is what a typical recurrent neural network looks like. So let's first imagine a normal artificial neural network and squash it. Or rather, let's take a look at it from the top view. It should look like this. All the layers are still there, but we represent it like this. Now we add a temporal element, which is sort of like a feedback loop. We take this loop and unroll it or unfold it. By unrolling it, we simply mean that we write out the network for a complete sequence. For example, if the sequence we care about is a 5 chess moves, the network would unroll into a 5 layer neural network, one layer for each move where x of t is the input at time step t, h of t is a hidden state at time step t. It is the memory of the network, where h of t is calculated based on the previous hidden state and the input at the current state. O of t is the output at step t. O of t equals the softmax of v subset h of t. Unlike a traditional deep neural network, which uses different parameters at each layer, a RNN shares the same parameters, u, v, and w across all steps. This reflects the fact that we are performing the same task at each step, just with different inputs. This greatly reduces the total number of parameters we need to learn. So for our chess AI, we would input our current move at x of t, and our previous moves would come from our network at the previous iterations. Training RNNs Training a recurrent neural network is similar to training a traditional artificial neural network where we also use backpropagation algorithm, but with a few minor tweaks. 
Because the parameters are shared by all time steps in the network, the gradient at each output depends not only on the calculations of the current time step, but also on the previous time steps. If we look at an example, in order to compute the gradient at t equals 5, we would need to backpropagate 4 steps, and then sum up all the gradients. This is known as backpropagation through time, or BPTT. For now, just be aware of the fact that RNNs trained with BPTT have difficulties training long-term dependencies. By this, we mean that dependencies between the steps that are far apart. This is due to what we call the vanishing or exploding gradient problem. Let's delve into these problems with a bit more detail, shall we? Vanishing and exploding gradients One of the problems of training neural networks, especially very deep neural networks, is data vanishing and exploding gradients. What that means is that when you're training a very deep neural network, your derivatives or your slopes can sometimes be either very very big or very very small, maybe even exponentially small, and this makes training difficult. This problem is known as either vanishing or exploding gradients. Starting with vanishing gradients, which makes your network only remember recent events and forget more distant past iterations. This problem causes a difficulty found in training artificial neural networks with gradient-based learning methods, as well as backpropagation. Remember that gradients are the rate at which the cost or error function changes with respect to the weights of a bias of a network. We train our network using backpropagation using the chain rule, if you remember some of the calculus. This has an effect of multiplying n of these small numbers to compute gradients of the front layers in an n layer network, meaning that the gradient error signal, listen properly, decreases exponentially with n while the front layers train very slowly. So we can take our RNNs and imagine that we get a smaller and smaller error propagated back in time, thus having a minimal effect on all the memories. Now the vanishing gradient problem is not only a problem with just RNNs, but also very complex deep artificial neural networks. Basically any network that is trained through backpropagation. Exploding gradients are like vanishing gradients, except the gradients tend to grow exponentially as opposed to decay. Because think about it, if our weights happen to reach larger values, we'd be multiplying a lot of big numbers and the gradient would explode rather than vanish. So to summarize, if the weights are small, it can lead to a situation called vanishing gradients, where a gradient signal gets so small that learning either becomes very slow or stops working altogether. If the weights in the matrix are large, it can lead to a situation where the gradient signal is so large that it can cause the learning to diverge. This is often referred to as exploding gradients as we mentioned. So encountering either of these problems leads to extremely long training times and may lead to poor performance and low accuracy during the inference of your algorithm. So you really want to avoid this. Ok so we got these problems, now what? Let's take a look at the solutions for exploding and vanishing gradients. One of them is gradient clipping. This is a very simple trick which is very helpful. We basically prevent gradients from blowing out of proportion by clipping the norm of the gradient at some threshold. So we just scale them down to whenever they pass above a certain threshold. And this trick is mainly used for exploding gradients. Activation function. The ReLU activation function can be used to solve for vanishing gradient problems. Because in this case, while the derivative of the sigmoid is less than 0.25 everywhere, making each term even smaller, the derivative of the ReLU function is 1 at every point above 0, creating a more stable network. This is also one of the reasons why inverse tangent activation functions is sometimes preferred over sigmoid. Long term, short term memory or LSTMs. We'll discuss this popular method in detail in a bit. Identity initialization. This is where an identity matrix or a scale version is used to initialize the recurrent weight matrix. Geoffrey Hinton et al. found that their solution is comparable to LSTMs on four benchmarks. They see me rolling, they hate it. Check out his paper called A Simple Way to Initialize Recurrent Networks of Rectified Linear Units, also known as ReLU. LSTMs. Now, of course, there are many tricks and techniques for efficiently training RNNs, but let's talk more about the popular methods we mentioned earlier, which is LSTMs or long term short term memory. The LSTM architecture was designed to make it easy to remember information over long periods of time until it's needed. The name refers to the idea that activations of the network correspond to the short-term memory while the weights correspond to the long-term memory. 
If the activations can preserve information over long distances, that makes them long-term, short-term memory. So what is the voodoo that goes inside an LSTM memory cell? Let's split it up into three main steps. We decide what from the previous cell state is worth remembering and tell the cell to forget the stuff we decide is irrelevant. We selectively update the cell state based on the new input we just seen and then we selectively decide what part of the cell state we want to output as the new hidden state. This is all achieved by a few simple gates, the forget gate, the input gate and the output gate. We'll leave the specifics of LSTMs for another video. Here are some exciting applications of RNNs. They can be used for speech recognition. So given an input sequence of acoustic signals from a sound wave, we can predict the text that has been spoken from a variety of accents, dialects, pitch, and other language variations. Language modeling and generating text. Given a sequence of words, we want to predict the probability of each word given the previous word. Machine translation. Machine translation is similar to language modeling in that our input is a sequence of words in our source language, example Hindi, and we want to output a sequence of words in our target language, for example English. Generating image descriptions. Together with convolutional neural networks, RNNs have been used as part of a model to generate descriptions for unlabeled images. We can see from these images we can detect a dog that is playing catch near a fence, a man playing an accordion, or even a woman playing tennis. Imagine the possibilities of this. One day this technology can be used to identify acts of crime or to save people's lives should they suffer with a particular health condition. Okay, so that is it from me. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and share. Click that bell icon if you'd like to see more machine learning tutorials. Also, producing these videos consumes a lot of time and coffee and we'd really appreciate it if you can support us on Patreon. You can find the link in the description down below. If you'd like to download the script to this video, please click the link down below to download for free. Stay tuned to the next lecture where we can see how we can implement an RNN in Python and Keras. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next lecture.